Hello there, thank you for staying with us and welcome to another edition of Channel's Beam. I am Victor Mathias. Now, Nigeria in recent times has witnessed a rise in security breaches across the country as scores of people have been killed, maimed, sacked from their villages, with Boko Haram even hoisting its flags in some communities in Niger State. But thankfully, some of these areas have been recaptured through joint security operations. Today on the program, we will be looking at the efficacy or otherwise of the efforts being made to bring the security challenges in Nigeria to an end. But before we get into all of that, let's first take a look at the trending topics in the past week. Nigerians across the globe, including former Vice President Atiku Abubakar and former Senate President Bukola Saraki, have lent their voices to call for justice for the late Miss Inyobong Umoren, who was raped and killed during her quest to seek a job in Akwa Ibom State. The victim's friend, Umor Udwak, had taken to Twitter on Thursday, 29th of April, to call out for help that her friend, who was going for a job interview at Airport Road, was in trouble. This led to an outburst in social media with different reactions and many calling for justice. Similarly, the call for the persecution of Nollywood actor Babai Jesha heightened after a video of him pleading for forgiveness after being caught on CCTV attempting to molest a 14-year-old girl at comedian Princess's home emerged. While the actor could be heard saying that he is aware that what he did was wrong, but he is sorry and that he should be forgiven, Nigerians remain adamant that the law must take its full course. Well, there you go. Those were some of the trends in the past week. But you can be a part of the conversation from wherever you're watching around the world. Just tweet at us at Channels TV, at Channels Beam, at Victor underscore MBIDI. And you can also use the hashtag Channels Beam. But uh, joining us to look at the topic of the day, uh, we have with us uh, Makari Confidence. He is a geopolitical and security analyst with SBM Intelligence in Lagos. He joins us right here in the studio. It's a pleasure to have you today. Thank you for having me. Of course. We also have joining us uh, via Zoom, Nkasi Wodu. He is a lawyer who works as a peace building manager for the Partnership Initiatives in the Niger Delta and the lead facilitator of the Partners for Peace Network. And he is also joining us uh, via Zoom. Um, Nkasi, it's a pleasure to have you join us on the program today. Thank you very much for having me. Indeed. Well, kickstart the conversation for us um, from your location. Um, as it is, um, a lot has been going on in the past uh, weeks, months, if you like, and even years. Um, but how do we move from where we are, you know, to a safe and a secure state? Um, I think that the, the problems are complex. I mean, almost every Nigerian would be the first person to tell you that. Um, the problems that plague Nigeria and that cause insecurity in Nigeria are quite complex. Um, you have so many issues stemming from structural violence, um, to a proliferation of arms and light weapons and, and all of that. Um, for me, I, I think that one of the problems that we have right now is that we focus so much on the military approach. Um, we focus so much on a, a security approach to addressing the issues. Um, we, we need to have a multiple... Um, we need to address insecurity from multiple prongs. Um, we need to look at it in terms of dialogue. How do we address issues around structural violence, for instance? Um, how do we make sure that, for instance, that um, law enforcement are, are, is more effective, is more, um, is more accountable to, to citizens? How do we make sure that um, abuse, human rights violations and human rights abuses um, are actually not go unpunished? I mean, those are some of the things that we need to look at. We need to look at issues around mediation and also strengthening dialogue between particular communities or ethnic groups. And we need to have a national conversation. Um, this issue or this approach where we think that we can outgun every problem, um, it's, it's really not working and it doesn't look like we're learning from it. Well, um, hopefully, the, I mean, these approaches you're talking about can be, you know, put into place. Um, uh, but I'll come back to you in just a bit. Uh, let me quickly hear from you, uh, you know, um, confidence. So all of these is taking place, small arms 
you know, are coming into the country and they're being moved also, you know, um, in various dimensions. But how do we stop this movement? I mean, because without these arms, some of these security challenges will not be prevalent. Well, it, it has been said in so many fora that Nigeria does not have borders. All we have are just lines drawn in the sand. And uh, one of the key reasons why we are not able to stop the flow of illicit arms is that our border security uh, is too lax. Um, border, border security is a key challenge in this part of the world. And um, based on the fact that we do not have uh, a complete number or we do not know for sure the amount of people we have coming in, in the country or currently residents in the country, we are not able to be able to, if, to, to man our borders effectively. And so um, just a few, a few days ago, in the middle of April, uh, it was reported that Nigerian uh, authorities in Agadez stopped uh, a cage of arms that were going into the Northeast. And they stopped about 77 AK-47 and about 3,000 rounds of ammunition. And well, upon interrogation, the gun runner told them that the weapons were meant for Nigeria's Northeast, which was to fuel the insurgency in Bono, Yubi, and Andamawa, as it were. And so one of the key ways to curtail violence is to police your borders effectively. So when you know that these are the outlets where these things are coming in from, you know where to stop it. And as it stands right now, we have of course, legal borders. But the thousands and thousands of illegal borders and illegal entry points into the country are not properly manned. They're not properly accounted for. And security in those places are lax. And so we also have the problems of corrupt customs officials and corrupt border officials who, of course, let these things into the country, you know, for a few, some or the other. And so if we really want to tackle these challenges head on, we need to take our border protection and our border security very, very seriously. Um, so, I mean, uh, we, we understand that the president has, um, uh, how would I put it now, he has um, given the go-ahead for a center for the control of small arms and light weapons, uh, you know, to be established. Um, does that sound like a good plan moving forward? Well, uh, as, as a country, we are not short of plans and policies. Implementation is a key issue. Um, towards the end of 2020, the Inspector General of Police uh, asked commissioners of police across the country to across the country to embark on a disarmament campaign to rid the country of illegal arms and small and, and small arms and light weapons for context nigeria currently has at least 6 million arms in the hands of in the hands of uh, non state actors why only 586000 are in the hands of security officials and so uh, the president is in this center is a good thing, but implementation is key. Uh, I'll give you another example. Last year, towards the end of last year, as I was saying, the police embarked on a disarmament campaign. Uh, we, we never had the last of it. It didn't go anywhere. And so this happened in August. And then sometime in this year, around February or March, we're having a situation whereby the Minister of Defense is actually asking Nigerians to arm themselves for self-defense and push back bandits or terrorists or whatever nomenclature you like to ascribe to them. And so this mismatch, policy mismatch from the government is one of the key drivers of insecurity and instability in the country because on one hand, you're having one government policy to address this issue. And then on the other hand, a certain government official is undermining those efforts. And so we need a synergy. If you're actually going to go forward, you need sustained sustainability. If the president has instituted this center, what is the progress report? How far has it gone? Monitoring, implementation, and evaluation is necessary to bring this in under control. All right. Um, let me come back to you and Cassie. I mean, now, looking at institutions, like you said, there needs to be some form of synergy uh, for all of these institutions, you know, for it to be able to, or uh, for any of the policies and the plans that are being made to be um, as effective as they should be. But in your own estimation, and also, you know, looking at the fact that the president has given the go-ahead for the establishment of the center that would uh, monitor and also ensure that small arms and light weapons don't move around uh, as often as they do as we speak, um, what is your estimation or valuation of the synergy between security agencies in the country at the moment? I, I think that there needs to be a more coherent strategy. I, I think that um, the strategy is not coherent at all. I mean, just last week, we had instances where um, the Nigerian Air Force actually bombed members of the Nigerian Army. Um, the, the, and that is just one instance where that has happened, just an example of one instance where that has happened. Um, we, we need to have a more coherent strategy, um, not just amongst um, the, the military or the various arms of the military or the armed forces, but also between the military and other um, law enforcement agencies like 
the, 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 um, the Nigerian police, for instance. So it needs to be more coherent. Um, we haven't seen that coherence. And um, also in terms of um, the fight against insurgency and banditry and all of that, I mean, um, Makari confidence was spot on in terms of um, what he talked about, the issues around um, proliferation of arms and, and um, open borders in Nigeria. Um, for instance, in, in Niger, and he, he did talk about Niger, um, banditry, I mean, um, elements engaged in banditry in Nigeria are actually fueling banditry as well across the border in Niger. And so that is something that we also need to look at, not just in terms of coherence or of strategy between law enforcement agencies, but in terms of coherence or strategy between our neighbors, between Niger, between Chad, and, and between all the other um, and countries that, that have joined Nigeria that we share borders with. How are we engaging with them? How are we working with them? It's not just about having... Um, cooperation agreements on paper. Well, how do we put those cooperation agreements into implementation? How are we ensuring that we are actually uh, working with these particular agencies to sort of police the borders better? Because um, insurgents and bandits, of course, um, find it very easy to move across borders. Um, they find it very easy to move from one spot to the other. Um, they, today they are in Niger, tomorrow they are in Nigeria. And there are a lot of unpoliced borders and ungoverned spaces within um, Nigeria and across Nigeria's borders. And if we do not pay attention to this particularly, then what we simply will be doing will be akin to just pouring a cup of water on the region in Fed. All right, so just before I go, um, uh, before I let you go, rather, um, uh, what of the military spending? Um, how well would you say, not even the military, but generally the spending on security, military, um, uh, police, you know, all the other um, paramilitary as well, how uh, well or how much more do you think we need to do in that aspect, just before I let you go quickly? I mean, so we've had consistently um, the amount of money that is um, put in the in the AMA budget every year for defense and for security. Um, we, we've seen that since the beginning of the insurgency, I mean, like since 2011, and it continues to increase and rise. Um, but, but we often hear of very sad stories of members of the Nigerian military crying. We see pictures, we see videos of them look as if they are abandoned. They do not have the requisite instruments and the requisite equipment or weapons to actually prosecute the war against insurgency and the war against banditry. And so it doesn't look like the problem really is about spending. The problem really should be about what are we doing with the money? How about accountability? And that's something that we really need to look at um, because we keep putting all of these amounts of money into the budget, but we do not see that on the ground. I mean, even in instances where we're able to actually buy equipment, we, we see that, we, we oftentimes we see that insurgents are quickly are quick to mount ambushes and actually take those state equipment or, or weapons from the Nigerian military. And, and it's quite sad. So to answer to your question, I, I don't think it's more about spending. It's more about accountability. Um, people need to begin to ask the hard questions of the service chiefs. We need to ask the hard questions regarding how much is being spent here. How much actually goes to the Nigerian soldier? We need to do an audit of how much does Nigeria pay per soldier in terms of prosecuting the war against uh, insurgency and banditry. And, and again, I, when I mentioned earlier, it's not just about us outgunning. We, we also have this problem where we just want to outgun every problem. We need to focus also on conflict prevention approaches. We need to ensure that what are we putting in place to increase dialogue and build social cohesion in some of the communities. I mean, it, many of the communities right now that are in Boko Haram, under Boko Haram occupation, were at some point freed from Boko Haram occupation in five, three years, four years ago. But now, because there weren't any action put in place to build social cohesion, to actually ensure that those communities um, are work around um, dialogue, uh, we, we see that those communities have continually become a fodder for, for Boko Haram's infestation as well. Right. And so that's something that we really need to pay attention to. Well, um, I hope that while we're paying attention to all of that, um, all of the questions that you also um, are posing uh, would also be answered. But I have to say thank you for joining us um, on the program today, uh, Munkasi Uwodu. Um, thanks once again for joining us. Thanks for having me. Indeed. We'll take a quick break. And of course, when we return, we will continue with the discussion. Please stay with us.
Staying with us, uh, we still have with us uh, right here in the studio, Makari Confidence. Um, so just before we went on the break, um, Ngasi talked about what we need to do. I mean, not only he said we don't just need to uh, look at our spending or improve our spending. He said apart from improving and, you know, looking at our spending, he also made mention of other things that we should do uh, to go hand in hand with that. But um, in your own um, thinking, what do you think, uh, again, should uh, we should be doing apart from, you know, all of the things that he said? We should actually go back to the drawing board. One of the first things that goes to here in the first place where we are having insecurity in uh, the worst states it has been since the Civil War is that the economy has been battered so badly that young people are not actually finding things to do and so are becoming a pool for recruiting of these, many of these various armed groups that are waging a war against the state. And so if you fix the economy, you fix at least 40 to 60% of the problem because many of all these things that are happening today are being perpetrated by the young people. And Nigeria is a country that has a median age of uh, around 19.1, and so you're more likely to have 60% of younger people in the country. And so if you cannot provide for these young people, of course they have to fend for themselves. And so crime is a way that pay. Unlike the normal notion where we're trained with that crime was not, does not pay. Right now it does pay. And so if you fix the economy, if you get out of the way of young people in order to thrive, in order to survive, you have to actually fix the problem. And so when you fix the economy, you fix a lot of other things. And we've also talked about border security. So it's like a ripple effect. It's a ripple effect. It's a, it's a ripple effect. And um, we, we've talked about border security. We've talked about other peace building efforts. We also talk about approaches to violence. Um, the, the Nigerian, the fourth Nigerian response to every security issue is the deployment of the military. It does not solve, it does not solve much. It will only kick the can down the road for a short period. But you will come to rule the effects much, much later. The first time the military was introduced to Nigeria's internal politics was in 1962 with the TV riots. And ever since then, every single administration has actually approached every internal security threat as a threat to regime security and then they deploy the military. It has always led to different problems, different problems of massacres, mass atrocities. I mean, 2020 was not short of it. We had the Lekki massacre, we had the one in Oigwe Rivers, we also had the one in Oshun. And so you cannot keep depending on the military to solve your internal conflict situations. I'll give you an example. In, as of 2019, the Nigerian military was involved in at least 35 out of 36 states running different international security operations. So towards the end of 2019, the federal government decided to withdraw the military much to the chagrin of many communities, especially in the Middle Belt. We have a situation where Taraba and Benue communities are actually fighting each other in communal clashes. If you check, since that period, communal clashes between border states or boundary states have increased exponentially. In the past, we used to have communal clashes domiciled in geographical east, eastern part of the country. Right now, it is spreading towards the north central and towards the, north, uh, the northwestern part of the country. So what? The, what the president actually had in mind to do was that when he withdraw the military into the barracks, the police would step in to secure these areas. But you can't step in to police these areas effectively without police reform. Reform costs money, and the government is not willing to spend those money on reform in order to secure the country internally, and that's why we are having this problem. Well, so it's a good thing you made mention of the North Central, uh, because we would actually be going to the North Central now, where we have with us uh, Malaji Ahmed Ibrahim Matane. He is the secretary to the state government of Niger State, and he joins us via Zoom from Mina the state capital. Well, um, it's sure. a pleasure to have you on the program today. It's a pleasure to have you on the program again, um, uh, the SSG. All right, we seem to be having um, network challenges. So let me just uh, come back to you again now. I mean, talking about reforms, this is one of the things that has been um, on the table or at the front burner of security discussions, you know, in, 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 in time, times past. Uh, and, and people keep talking about how we should have these reforms. And But it seems to be, I mean, like you said now, reforms take a lot of money. But reform, you know, seems to be broad. I mean, if you are to break it into pieces, which would you say, apart from money, what else do you think is also important when you're you know, you know, undergoing you, you, reforms? You know, you simply, talking about the Nigerian police as an instance, you simply cannot continue to reform it in its current structure. And so for the, the cause for restructuring in terms of the liberalization of the security sector is growing. And so if we're going to reject the security architecture internally, we're going to have to look at liberalizing policing 
across from the federal level down to the state level. And so we've been having a lot of community policing efforts. One of the reasons why Operation Amotekun is not taking off the way the public actually expected it to take off is because there seemed to be a rivalry between Amotekun and the police. At the beginning, the police said they were not going to share intelligence with Amotekun operatives. And so without intelligence, you are going in blindly into an operation. And so if you want to get community policing right, first of all, you need to find the political will, and then you need to get on it. By getting on it, it actually means looking for the constitutional backing to actually uh, impress upon your efforts. If you want to have a policing that works, you need to bring it closer to the people. A federally controlled police force actually answers only to the center. And so we have a situation whereby we have governors that are chief security officers of their states, but, cannot, but control. cannot control the police because the police answers to the president. And so what we're trying to have at the moment is that we are trying to tell governors to work hand in hand with the police in their states. Yes, of course, there's the argument that many of these states are not viable enough to handle policing. That's not a problem. You mean economically? Economically. To pay police, because a lot of them are struggling to pay salaries of workers. I mean, you see what's going on in Kaduna right now. That's not a problem. For states that are viable, the non-viable states, what do you do? You simply encourage them to increase IGR in order to meet up. Now, until they meet up, the federal government should take charge of policing in those areas. But the states are that, that are able to be able to pay these people, let them go ahead and have community police. Liberalize the police constitutionally so the state governors and the local governments would take more power. Now, one of the reasons why we are having obstacles to these things is that even in a multi ethnic state, perhaps in a state like Benue, where we have a lot of ethnic groups, you can't simply have the governor controlling the entire levers of the police force. At the end of the day, the local government administrators would have to come in. And so when, many things that the governors are fearing in these things is giving powers to the local government chairman. And so the same thing they are accusing the federal government of doing, of having enormous broad power. Pretty much the... They are also having the same thing. So everybody is a dictator in his own enclave. And so until we have these reforms, until we democratize these things, we are still going to go around in circles. Well, um, I just hope we don't keep going around in circles. Hopefully we would uh, you know, implement all of the solutions that you've been proffering uh, since we commenced the program, but I have to say thank you as well uh, for joining us thank on, you very the, much on for the program me. today. Um, uh, Makari Confidence. Yeah, no problem. Thanks again. Well, that's uh, where we are. We'll take uh, a look at the most viewed videos on our YouTube channel in the past week. Please stay with us. Senator Smart's lamenting and weeping on the floor of the Senate chambers about the sorry state of Nigeria's security kicks off this week's most viewed videos in fifth place. The president must know that this is a bad time for our nation. We must look for foreign support to save this nation. This is my position, Mr. President. We must rise to it. There are killing people in the east, in the west, in the south, in the north. We should shut down the National Assembly. Let's shut down if we cannot save this country. We stay in our homes. In fourth, the claim by the River State Governor, Yesom Wiki, that federal government is not concerned about the state of security in the country. And when the government cannot protect land and property, then that government has failed. It has no two ways about it. It has no propaganda that can solve the problem. Third place sees the threats by Ijo youths to shut down the economy of the Niger Delta region. When we say we are shutting down, there will be no activity. And that is the major reason why internally in our meeting, we have advised our people, anybody you can help, the moment we get close to this activity, anybody you can help with dairy, rice, beans, whatever, do because we are going to lock down activity in the region. No road movement, no water movement, no activity within that period. And that is why we say we cannot guarantee the safety of oil workers at that time. The arrival of the first flight to the Anambra airport takes the second spot. While the allegation by the governor of Benue State, Samuel Otom, that the president is working for Fulanis comes in as the most viewed video in the past week. We are being overstretched and this is not acceptable. The body language, the action and inaction of Mr. President shows that he's only the president of Fulani people. 
And there you go. Those were the most viewed videos on our YouTube channel in the past week. And also, that's where we wrap it up on the show today. Thank you so very much for watching. I'm Victor Mathias.